Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Blueprints in Unreal Engine, a beginner tutorial for Unreal Engine 5. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is David Tavares. I'm the lead designer for Game Studio Occupational Hazard. I'm a certified Unreal Engine 5 world builder. I'm a member of the Unreal Fellowship, and I have a background in RPGs, being both on the Gen Con staff and a longtime GM, DM, and storyteller for many games. By taking this tutorial, you will learn basics about what a blueprint is and how it works, common blueprint classes and their purpose, the anatomy of a blueprint, an example of a playable character blueprint, I'll give you an example of a widget blueprint, I will also give you an example of a blueprint prefab with construction scripts, and I will show you where you can learn more about blueprints. The target audience for this tutorial are complete beginners. However, this tutorial may also serve as a refresher for more experienced users. I will be using Unreal Engine version 5.1.1. I'll be doing this in Windows 11. And I'll be using the Content Examples project from the Samples tab of the Unreal Launcher. If you'd like to follow along exactly, you can find these things in the Unreal Launcher and launch everything and set it up this way. If you would rather use slightly different versions, you may as well. The variation should be very minimal. You may follow along or simply watch this tutorial. If you would like to use the Content Examples project, click the Samples tab in the Launcher. Look under Unreal Engine Feature Samples to find the Content Examples. I already have it purchased here, but you can purchase it for free. It, the button should be here, but you should also create the project after you purchase it in the same tab here. And you'll find that in your Library tab, and it will create a project for you, which you can then open and continue. Part 1. Basics. In this section, we will talk about what are blueprints, how do blueprints work, where can blueprints be found, and blueprint types. Let's get to the root of this tutorial and answer the question, what are blueprints? Blueprint visual scripting is based on using a node-based interface. Blueprints are used to define object-oriented classes in the engine. Blueprints allow for the full range of programming tools, and Blueprints can extend C++ classes. This means that you can use visual scripting to have nodes and attach them to create various types of programs. Now, how do Blueprints work? Visual scripting allows for creation of complex gameplay elements. Blueprints use nodes for objects, functions, and events. Nodes are connected by wires for complex interactions. A complete blueprint may implement behavior and functionality. Where can blueprints be found? Blueprints can be found on the blueprint list on the toolbar. You can also right click in the content browser and select blueprints. Content packs are also often full of pre-made blueprints. Blueprints are very commonly used in all Unreal Engine 5 projects. Let me show you. You may find blueprints on the toolbar up here. You can have a new empty blueprint class here, or you can open a specific blueprint class here as well. If you right click in the content browser, you'll see this blueprints right here. A uh, blueprint class can be found here. And content packs are chock full of blueprints. For instance, here's the character blueprint of Echo. There are many different blueprint types. There's the common level blueprint, which is mandatory since every map needs its own level blueprint. There are several common types of blueprints, which I will go over in a moment. And there are many specialized specific types of blueprints. In fact, uh, the last I checked, I saw 1,058 different types. Part two, common blueprint classes. There are some blueprint classes that are often used more than others. These include Actor, Pawn, Character, Player Controller, Game Mode Base, Actor Component, and Seed Component. Let's take a look at these classes and discover what they can do. Now back in the level, I'll show you the different types of blueprints, the common types of blueprints. You can either bring them up here on the top toolbar, 
new empty blueprint class pops up this pick blueprint class setting or you can right click and click blueprint class these are the common types of blueprints you have the actor an actor is an object that can be placed in the world like a tree or a chair for example you also have a pawn which is a possessible actor that receives input from a controller that could be literally a pawn or it could be a character but uh, they have a special class for that a character is a type of pawn that includes the ability to walk around that's a very common in most games there's also the player controller player controller is responsible for controlling a pawn that's used by a player you can also see down here in the lower right player controller class is set to the game mode and the game mode base class defines the game being played its rules scoring and other facets of the gameplay You have the actor component. An actor component is a reusable component that can be used added and added to any character. It's something you can just attach to multiple characters. And the scene component. Similar, it could be a component that has a scene transform that could be attached to other scene components. Let's take a further look at these. Part 3, Anatomy of a Blueprint. In this section, we'll go over what's in a blueprint and what you can expect when you work with a blueprint. When you're in a blueprint, you can see the top navigation, toolbar, components, my blueprint, functions, macros, variables, event dispatchers, viewport, construction script, and event graph. That's quite a few things, so let's go over them. On the top of the screen, you can see the top navigation menu bar. Here you see file, edit, window, tools, build, select, actor, and help. In a blueprint, uh, these can change a bit. You can use the top navigation menu bar to access editor specific commands and functions. So in the level blueprint, you can see that that's changed to file, edit, view, debug, window, tools, and help. And in a character blueprint, you can see that assets was also added. Each editor in Unreal Engine has a menu bar that is located on the top right editor of the window in Windows operating system. And if you're using Mac OS, it'll be at the top of the screen. Some of the menus are present in all editor windows, while others will be editor specific, such as debug for both these blueprints, the level blueprint and the character blueprint here. As the blueprint debugger uh, this deserves its own tutorial since we're just an intro i'll just show you where these are and we'll get that into more advanced courses and they both also have this assets tab no sorry excuse me the, uh, correct that they don't both have the assets tab only the character blueprint has that because it's an asset the level being a level um, isn't an asset that you have in here it's an entire level that you would have to open it's kind of a different blueprint so to get the, to the level blueprint, you would click here and go open level blueprint. You want to just open the level, so you can't just navigate directly to the editor blueprint. The, sorry, the level blueprint. You'll have to find it here when you're in the level. However, here, like in the assets tab, you can say find a content browser, and that's the asset. Now concerning the blueprint toolbar, which is this line right up here, you have your save icon clicking this saves it you have the browse to associated asset button which if you click that it will browse directly to the blueprint that you have selected opening the blueprint again you have compile which you need to do any time that you change any code or if you like move something if i compile it now it went from dirty to good to go if I break one of these wires, I'll reattach it to. It needs to compile again. You'll see that it's got the question mark when it needs to be recompiled. It won't run properly or as you changed it until it is compiled. And you get the green check mark. There are some other signs that this could have too. It could also have an exclamation point if there's a warning during compilation. And or it might have a circle, red circle with a minus through it. If there's a if there's a failure and an error, 
I mean, your errors will appear down here in your results, but that's we'll get to that later. This is the different versions. If you have a source control enabled, currently I don't, but if you did, you could see that here. This can find a particular reference in the content browser. Here, this will hide unrelated. So let me show you that. So I selected this node. I'll explain what some of these will in the next section. Turn, uh, input access turn. This connects to this add yaw, which is why they're highlighted. Everything else is sort of faded out there. If I unhide related, there we go. Pops them in and out. That way, if you see anything that's connected, uh, directly connected, it will it will show where it is. So if I could click this one, for example, you can see anything that it's connected to will be there. The class settings here are this shows certain things in the details for the that are pertinent to the the exact class of blueprints that it is. I'll explain some of these further in, in a more advanced course. And the class defaults, it's another set of details here, which shows the class detail defaults in the details panel here. Play mode. This will play the project, the start the level, start the game in the viewport. You have options to play different versions here if you want to do the same mobile preview play the editor in a new window or as a standalone game or just simply run a simulation without a one of, the, the, one of these other play modes. You also have certain options here, for instance, like number of players or where you want to start the default character, whether it's the current camera location or the default player start and other advanced settings as well. And this right here, this no debug object selected, so if you had multiple instances of this blueprint, let's say it's a blueprint for a character and there's many characters in your level, this can uh, allows you so that if you are debugging actively, you can select different instances of it. So if there's like five different characters, this will have like five listed here and you can choose which ones to see what they're doing and what their blueprint is doing at the time. And that's where you can find that. That's more of an advanced debugging feature there, which is real nice. Next, we can go over the component window that's up here in this corner. This symbol is the symbol for components. If you remember earlier, there was a blueprint type for actors and for scenes of components. So this would be actor components. They can be attached to this particular blueprint because it's a character. You, anything that's an actor on can take a component. A component is a piece of functionality that can be added to an actor. Other blueprints such as pawns and characters are based on actor and therefore they inherit the ability to receive components. When you add a component to an actor, the actor will use the function that the component provides. For example, this is character movement, uh, which is a very complex component. Uh, it's inherited from a C++ code and it provides movement to a character. This includes factors you can see here on the right. This is the details panel for it. The mass of the character to calculate in this physics, the gravity scale, the step height. So if it's if it's uh, got legs and can walk up steps, this is the, the height that it will do within the engine. Character's basic, basic movement, jump velocity, all kinds of stuff. Swimming speed, flying speed, if you want to enable those types of functionality for the character. And that's all baked into this singular component. There are other types of components here. For example, camera. That's something that you can understand pretty simply when you play a game. There's a camera view which you're looking through, whether it's a first-person camera view through the eyes of the character or a third-person where you're above the character, for example. Um, or just as a, a floating camera, just watching a scene, for example. This character also has components that are uh, part of the its body, for example, this hair mesh. To add a component, you click this button up here. We can add this point light to its hair mesh. 
you see instantly the naming happens here. I could change that to light name, for example. Now I can click it again to change it again, light name one. Another way to rename it is to right click, rename. You can also duplicate, cut, copy, add events, find references to this component. Or if you want to see the C++ code here, you can also delete it. Now it's gone. Components can also be added in the browser here. You can click and drag to the blueprint and add it. You can also undo adding that component up here. Components are a very useful and powerful tool. All of them have their own features that can be seen in the detail pane to the right. For instance, transform, that's where they're located. Let's move on to the next part down here. Now let's talk about this section called My Blueprint. This tab over here has many various things in here, uh, but if you can divide them up into two larger categories, it would be graphs and variables. There are many types of graphs. The most common type is the event graph, but you can also find the construction script, functions, and macros. This is what a graph looks like. You can see it's segmented kind of like graph paper. You will see nodes in it, or you could put nodes in it, and you can connect them with these wires to other nodes to basically do a functionality. For example, this one says right mouse button, and the connector, connector here says check trace. So this is a function that's called. So when you hit right, right mouse button, this will happen. And this is in the event graph. The event graph happens in play mode. Now there's another type of graph called the construction script. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. It looks like this. Now, right now in this blueprint, nothing's happening in the construction script. But if I were to add something, I can click and drag off of the node. And what happens here is you'll see this executable actions. And this will show every within context function that you could call here. Like if I wanted an audio thing to happen. Oh, so something that might make sense. Clear sound mix modifiers. So if we had sounds going on here, that would clear them. I'll delete that because we don't need to do that, but whatever we need to do can happen here. The interesting thing about the construction script, this happens in editor mode, not necessarily not as soon as play mode. So if I needed to test something or construct something that I want to see in the editor, you can do that from the construction script. However, if it's not something you want to be happening in the editor and only in play mode, you'll do that in the event graph. The event graph's here. And construction script is here. Construction script is a function. I'll talk more about functions in a moment, but let's go back to the event graph and I can show you what a macro is. So as I said earlier, you can uh, use graphs within graphs. That's kind of what a macro is. Let's take this really complex one here. Now this does something when you input left click. It does this check trace. You don't actually have to follow all this. It just does a bunch of stuff here. And then you have these two end results here. You grab the object or drop the object. So if I click, so you can click and drag to select multiple nodes. So I'm clicking and dragging and I'm selecting all these nodes. So if I select all the nodes, you got to be careful because right now you see I selected these two as well. So if I want to click and drag, say these nodes, I can right click on them. And then I have all these options. I can collapse it. I can collapse to a function or it can collapse to a macro. Now let's do the macro first. And whoa, where do they all go? So it's still connected to all these other functions here, but now there's a new macro. I could rename it if I wanted to. 
you can see that it's down here in the corner. I can double click on it to go into it. And all those nodes, that's where they went. So in a macro, there's an input. And over here, there's the output. And you see that if it goes from the end here, it goes to true, output, and where's this output go? Where we left it off. Right here in the event graph, right there, and it's still connected. I can undo collapsing them into a single node. And let's say I want to create my own macro from scratch without pre-existing code. I can click here. You could do that for any of these. If you want a new graph, you can click here. New function, you can click here. New variable, you can click here, for example. And you notice it says input and output. It is possible to just have an input only. So let's say I say uh, print string. Print string is a very useful tool. You probably don't want to use it in an actual uh, project, but it's great for debugging. So I'll actually say something like it defaults to hello on the screen. So the so you can click and drag and it creates a connected node there. And you see you don't have to have an output. For example, I can just have an input and have it at the end of something. And right there, the new macro. So let's say if this is false, it's now going to print the string hello. But if I want to, I can double click on it to get back into the macro. Or I can have an output if I want it to then do something else or if there's information that I want to get from this to go somewhere to another node, for example, I can create that as a macro. And that way I can copy and paste that a million times. Let's say I put that very complex code in here. If I want this to happen multiple times, you can copy, control C, control V. There we go. Control V. Now there's another new node. If I wanted to connect these, for example, it would print it twice, or if I wanted something else like at the end of this to, to run it. Now, instead, let's say there was a lot of code, like a bunch of this, I collapsed that to a macro, and I wanted to use this in a lot of different locations. Now I can have it all neat and convenient in a single little macro. Now, as far as functions, I talked about the construction script. There's a lot of other functions in this particular player character blueprint as well. Um, so let's get into that. On the topic of functions, which can be found right here, right under the graph section, functions have a couple different variants. First that I can talk about is the override function here, which behave quite differently than other functions. I would say these behave a lot more like events. So in events, when uh, you call something that happens, like when you click or when the computer ticks or something like that. So this is an example is hit. So when something's hit, you can either call a wire out or grab one of these variables for some information or something like that. You notice that it was red. That's the color for events like event tick, for example, input action, left click. Event tick is something that's within the computer there will be ticks that happen periodically. And every time that that tick occurs, you notice that down here, it's got the output delta seconds as well, meaning the change in seconds. As seconds roll on, something happens. So left click, something happens. Overrides act a lot like that, even though they're functions. Fun other functions are much more similar to macros in a way. I can show you here with grab object. It's got an input and an output, as a standard function will. If I double click on it, you'll see that it behaves like a macro in that there is now a graph within a graph. This graph has grab object as the name of the function. And upon, you see it connects over here, does a bunch of things, and then it ends. You notice that there's no output. Despite there being no output, there is still an output node. Things can continue on with functions. To select the function, either on this side, you can see the details for the function. If you're within the function itself, you can click on this header node here, and we'll show you the same things. Uh, the name, 
you can say grab object or I can change it to grab objects for example now the name changed I'll change that back that's not necessary for the demonstration here the descriptions are optional if you want to put notes in there or let's say anybody else that wants to go in there or just to remind yourself you could put notes right here categories can be maintained here either you can type in your own category or the drop down shows other categories uh, that's also optional depending on your organizational style that's a good place to do that if you want to put certain functions in certain areas keywords can also be referenced so if you wanted to make sure that this is a see it's a grab object so maybe it, anything that has to do with object actions you can type that in there however you want to organize it axis specifiers are interesting there's three different versions public protected and private public is a setting of public means that any object other objects can call this function this is the default setting so whenever you create a function it's going to be public protected is a setting that means that the function can only be called by the current blueprint as well as any blueprint that derives from the current blueprint so if it if it directly derives from this blueprint uh, protected can access it however if it doesn't then it is it won't be able to access it kind of like private private's a setting which means the function can only be called within the blueprint so if you don't want anything else touching this particular action unless this blueprint is called you select private protect it as if there's some select other ones you want to have uh, access the function and public is if you know you don't you don't care if anything accesses it uh, honestly i use public like over 90 percent of the time i don't have any reasons to exclude functions because if i don't want to use it i just don't call it and there are a couple other functions down here there is pure and right now pure defaults to off pure changes how the function works in general so right now it's easier to see from here i believe if i make this pure suddenly well, the input and output wire nodes are gone. It's just this little green thing. If you noticed over here, there's some other green ones. So a, a green one is pure, a green node that is, and it has variables, but there's no wires to tell it to fire off. However, it does provide values. If I go back to this grab object and I go inside, if I want there to be an output, I select here there's inputs and outputs if i add inputs it starts adding all these pins down here new parameter new parameter one i can change the type of parameter the parameter oh, we'll get more into this in variables but each type of parameter has a different color coding i'll be talking about variables next outputs i can add some outputs Let's say yeah integer is fine so it's going to have this color as an output. I'm not sure if I need to attach that to show you. Let's see. Yeah, I don't need to attach it. So as you can see, it now it's starting to look a lot more like these. It's got inputs and outputs. So what happens is whenever some other function or some other node needs the data, it runs it automatically. It doesn't need to actually call and run the function. It just pulls the data of whatever happens within this object. Construction script is also under functions. As I said before, the construction script runs in the editor and is great for when you're trying to create a level. You can run things in construction script and it will show up right away. Next, let's move on to variables. Variables are a topic that you might want to take a deeper dive into. This is just a basic overview of what they are. You can find the variable section of a blueprint right here under my blueprint variables. To make your new blueprint, you can hit this plus button here. A variable is a place. It's a placeholder for a value or reference that you could call to interact with other code. There are several types of variables. If I create a new one here, you can see that the first one that pops up is Boolean. You can see these are the other types of variables you can make. 
A boolean is a true or false value. It is color-coded with this maroon, sort of a reddish color. And you can see, like, this, for example, it says physics handle active. This is a boolean, and the wiring will also be match the color of the type of data that it's holding. There's also a byte. That's this Sherpa blue. This integer is the C green. This is integer 64, which is a uh, integers with a, a more a longer range, but of course that means that it also takes up more data. There's a float. It's this yellow green. Float can have a decimal value. A name, which is a piece of text to identify something in the game, in this mauve color. There's this string that's in this magenta color. A string is a group of alphanumeric characters. So, so you can like form a whole, whole sentence, for example, with it. There's this text, which is the pink. There is this vector, which is this gold. They call this gold. A vector being an x, y, z coordinates. There's a rotator. This cornflower blue color. So that defines the rotation in 3D space, also like an x, y, z, but rotation instead of location. And a transform, which is both a location and a rotation together in this orange. And then... Anything else has this blue color. These are objects. There are many structure objects. There's this color, too, for an interface object, or an interface, rather. Or other object types, which can break down into an object reference, an object class, a soft object reference, or a soft class reference. So an object is, is an actual reference to the object, whereas a class is the object's class. Soft, or a soft reference versus a hard reference, is, it's directly to it, whereas a soft reference is an instance that may not be loaded yet, and it can be used to load asynchronously, which is kind of a more advanced topic, but is very, very useful while you're learning. I won't worry about that too much, but as you master and make things make your projects, this will be very, very useful to remember as well. So, work with that. And then there's the enumerators as well. So there's another way to create a variable. When a node will have values, like this one says reference self, you see it's this this blue, so it's a self it's an object reference. You could drag off and you could say promote to variable. Now it named it target, and you can see down here there's a new variable called target. I'll delete that. I don't need a variable called target. However, you can also see down here there's this weird eyeball or these closed eyes next to each variable. That means whether they're public or private. This one was already public. It says ignore actors. So if I, in the viewport here, in, in game, I threw in a player character. And let me go back here. If you click on it, you see that it is category default. I'll tell you more about these things in a second. Category default, if you click on the instance of the player character I put in there, which is this, you scroll down in its details, there's this default section, and there's only one item there, it says ignore actors. So these are editable in the actual instance. So if there was two of them, I could say this one has an extra array element. But if I click on this one, there's no extra array element. But if I click back, it has it. So they can be different even though it's the same blueprint. 
because they're two different instances of said blueprint. And if I add public variable for this one, the new variable, I should see, oh, I'd probably have to compile it first. You can now see that the new variable, the Boolean, can be true or false. Now that doesn't do anything yet, because I didn't hook it up to anything, but it's there, and it's instance editable, because of the I. Let's talk more about these features here. You can also make it private and public here. If you notice... You can name... The variable name could be changed up here, the variable type. Variable types can be changed even further with this selection here. Single means a single variable, so true or false in this case. An array means a, group, a large grouping of different true or false values. A set is a set order of multiple values. And a map is one variable matching two other variables. So that, that can make it more complex. So right now a boolean can't be a map, that's why it's grayed out. But if I made it say an integer, an integer map. So this integer will map out to, will this work? Can I make booleans? Yeah, so, so you see this is now color coded. So there's an integer associated with a boolean. Or I can make an integer associated with float. That's what a map is. Or I can change this to a Boolean. That's an array, for example. And this error popped up saying that a Boolean cannot be a map. So it helps you out there. You can type in a description as usual. The instance editable. There you go. It changes the eyeball down here if you do the instance editable. Private select sets it to private so it can't be used outside of this blueprint. Blueprint read only means that it, it, it could only be read the variable. I can't change the variable if, if I have this set up, so it sort of locks it out. Exposed to cinematics means that it it's, it's, can be exposed during sequencer. Sequencer in Unreal, if you don't know, is uh, cinematic. It can, it can make like a, uh, a little movie. It's, it's a much more advanced topic than this tutorial is covering, but I will make tutorials on it in the future, so look out for that. Category, uh, so replication, I already went over category. Uh, replication is if you're on a network, let's say you want to have uh, like a multiplayer game or something that's interactive with other people. Replication means that it's a variable that will affect on the network like other people can see it. So here I made this variable have this extra array to ignore actors. That affects me when I hit play. But if someone else is playing with me and we have a network and we're all playing in the same game, I have to indicate if it is replicated or if there's a rep notify that needs to occur or if there's no replication. And there's a whole bunch of replication conditions here, but that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Let's see if there's anything else I need to cover here for variables, I believe. There is a lot we could be covering, but that should cover it for now. I will make a more advanced course about variables in the future. In our next section, we should be talking about right here, the compiler results and find results and what that means. Let's talk a little bit about what happens here in the graphs. So the compiler results show what happens if you compile. It says, notice it changed a little bit when I click this, compile of player character successful in the amount of time. The time varies because the 
exact amount of time it takes changes. If there's an error, it will appear here and give you the information about what the error is or where the warning is. Another thing you can do is this find results. Any of these tabs, if you are missing them, as an aside, in window here, it shows you all the different tabs. For example, I'll uncheck, I'll close that. So the compiler results went away. I got the compiler results back. So if you accidentally move or destroy any of the tabs, you can find them up here. That's a good thing to know. So find results, it looks like I did a search for a print string at some point. So if you like right click on any node and you wanna find references, since it's a find function, it will find a reference to add yaw. So that's the only one there. But if I find something, will it work for branches? Find branch? Yeah, there's. it shows every branch. So I said find all branches and I can look down this list and see there's a whole bunch of branches in a different bunch of areas. So that's how you do a find. Things can get very complex with a bunch of functions and very large graphs. You can get a lot of spaghetti code and it might be difficult to find certain things, but if you're like, I know I did a branch there, it might narrow, help you narrow it down if you can't remember exactly what the code is. But if let's say you wanted to cast to BP button counter and you wanted to find it. Oh, it didn't. Wait, I must have clicked the wrong thing. Climbs to function, find, find reference. So yeah, I did click the wrong thing. Right there, there's only two references to it. There's the function itself, and then there's calling the function. Speaking of calling the function, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here in the graph itself. You see that there's these events. An event is something that happens, it's an event. For instance, this is input access turn and input access look up. So that's like, right here, it's the mouse input. My mouse itself is having an input as it moves around. So that's a very basic event that happens. And if you have code, you also want to comment it. So let me do an, a simple event that's called begin play. And at begin play, I'm going to print string. Hello. So if I select it all and hit the C button, it gives me a comment, I can say, Print hello at begin play. So it's good standard practice to comment out all of your code. Now, obviously, printing hello at begin play is not that incredibly useful, but this is a prime example of what you can do in Blueprint. There is one more feature that I did not mention earlier under my blueprint here, this last one called Event Dispatchers. This is actually a really powerful tool, Event Dispatchers. Now, if you pull it out, you're gonna see these different options. You don't get these options when you pull out, say, a variable. You get get or set. For variable, you can get the variable, whatever the number is, or whatever the variable is. If you set it, you can set the variable. So if on begin play, I can set it. Or I can say maybe plus plus increment the float to one. So what happens here, I take the current number of the handle distance, I add one to it, and set it so now it's one higher. I don't know what use that would be, but that's basically what you just did there. So I commented out. Nonsense. However, there's also the event dispatchers. I have call, bind, unbind, event, and assign. Now, what makes these useful is that it's an event that gets dispatched to anywhere within the level. So if you don't just want it to be in this blueprint, but you want it to have some sort of event that say your character dies and you want a whole bunch of different things to happen, you want it to play the death animation, you want the enemies to not be attacking you anymore, you want 
like a whole bunch of different other things. What you can do is bind all those different things to an event. In fact, there's a quicker way of doing this. You can click Assign, and this will give you a custom event. Custom events are very powerful as well. You can just do custom event, add custom event, and you can name it whatever you want. This would also be connected to the event dispatcher. Now, custom events don't need to be attached to event dispatchers, but if you want to use it as event dispatcher, it will require a custom event, and you can say print string, for example. In fact, we can assign this at begin play. So when you begin play, there's going to be a custom event to print to string hello, but it's not necessarily called right away. Maybe yeah, any time that I do the input access turned, I can call the function. And since it's called, I don't have to connect this to the custom event. It will happen. It's a little confusing right now if this is your first time exposed to this, but it's good to keep this stuff in mind while you learn and try to figure out what you, your goal is. For an example of a working blueprint, I will now talk about a character blueprint and how that actually works and show you some examples. Part 4. Playable Character Blueprint I'll go over a character blueprint and show you how it can play in the engine. We will go over art assets, the skeletal mesh, player controller, pawn, animation, game mode, and input. Let's begin by adding the third person feature pack to the project. There are many different types of feature packs you can add to any project that come in a nice little prepackaged content here. Uh, you could do it in Blueprint C++ or just the starter content itself, which is a nice little collection of miscellaneous assets. But the one we're looking for is this Blueprint third person. Add to project. I already have. All you have to do is click this and then hit cancel to get out of it. You should find this third person folder in there after you add that to your project. And here's the third person character. Now, this project doesn't start with the third person character here. It starts with the player character, I believe. So go over to, next to details, there's this world settings. Select game mode, default pawn class. You're going to want to do blueprint third person. Actually, you know what? Change the whole thing to third-person game mode, and that puts all the settings from the third-person game mode in here. That way, if you hit play, you can see that there is now a third-person character. This is Quinn. She's the better half of the pair Manny and Quinn, doing the male and female representation of the mannequin body forms. So if I hit escape, it gets me out of play mode. And to go to the blueprint, just double click on the blueprint itself. And you can see there's the tab for viewport, construction script, and event graph. We've already talked about construction event script and event graph. In the viewport, you can see what's actually in the blueprint as far as assets. There's the skeletal mesh of Quinn. There's a camera. You can see here that if you click the root item, you can see a lot of the assets that are within it, including the skeletal mesh assets, the animation class, and a lot of the other features, even the camera, other meshes. So you can swap things out. For example, Quinn here, she has her own animation blueprint. We can 
navigate to that. You just click the button next to it to navigate to. This button is to replace it. Let's just navigate to it. You'll see that Manny's got an animation blueprint and Quinn's got an animation blueprint. Now this is a whole nother can of worms that we'll get to in a more advanced course about what animation blueprints do, but it is in fact a blueprint. And it shows the whole animation set. So for example, running around, jumping, landing, idle, those are all animations in the animation blueprint. Now, Manny and Quinn both share a lot of the same animations. They are, in fact, compatible. If you were to add a mesh that wasn't compatible, for example, the starfish, it's a very interesting starfish, you'll see that there's no running or jumping animations, no idle animation. Now, it does turn. In fact, it doesn't turn very well, but it does turn. You'll notice here, the animation class went away because it's not compatible with this skeletal mesh asset because the skeletal mesh for this mesh doesn't quite work out. But if I go back to Manny, and if I use the Quinn, animation blueprint, it works for him. It's compatible. Now you've got Manny instead of Quinn doing the same animations. Hit escape again. Let's go back to Quinn since these are her animations. Simple Quinn. Easy enough. Now, if you had animations for the starfish, you can put that in. You see there's also, like, a tentacle here. Lots of interesting things in this pack. This is all from the sample content, not from the third person. Third person only has Manny and Quinn in it. You can undo adding the content, and then it'll bring it back. These are the materials for the body. For example, if I make this material instance pyramid, she's now very pink in those areas. You can see there's two different elements for this asset mesh. The material goes here for those, and yeah, let's do pool. She's made out of water in these parts. You see the shaders compile, preparing shaders. Now she's made out of water here, and made out of pink here. <laughs> so that's kind of an interesting looking character, but I prefer the original, so let's undo those. There we go. Now let's play around with the actual blueprint here. You can see this is the jump input. It's got the nice comment. Jump input, jump could be configured with the character movement component. Let's do a couple different variations here. So if I right click, I can say keyboard see there's a lot of keyboard events here zero through nine work off the keyboard let's do the letter e so this means when i press the letter e on the keyboard it has a nice little symbol for a keyboard right next to it something happens right now we have jump assigned to spacebar and this is the correct way to do it in unreal engine 5 is to use the enhanced input system but you can also add something like a, just a keyboard click in E. So if I want to do this and make it so it's a pressed and released jump stop jumping, and I compile that, save it. I'm running around. This is the space bar jumps from the enhanced input system. But now I hit E, That's, I'm hitting E now. It does the same thing because I told it to do the same thing when I press that button. I can do something else here. For example, I can do the debug print string to say hello. Print string also, you can like change the color. So let me make the color, it's a nice a blue, a dark blue this time. Nice deep dark blue. So now what's gonna happen is I hit E and it's going to print a string, hello. 
Now this is mostly for debugging, you'll see in a second. Hit E now. I'm not jumping, but if you could see in the upper left hand corner, it says hello. Every time I hit it, it, has, it sits hello. Notice they start to disappear. They start to disappear because the duration is set to two seconds. And you can do all kinds of things. You can edit the properties of all of these different components. You can create code in here. The possibilities are unending. Now let's say you want to, instead of using this as a character, this character blueprint, let's say you want to use it as a pawn. You can switch up the controller. See here it says AI controller class. And select a, another blueprint that you've created to be the AI for this pawn. Another thing I could show you or the, the skeletal mesh asset here. This is applied to that character. You notice there's many parts to this as well. It has its own skeleton tree. You can see that up here in the upper right hand corner, there's things you could click on. This has all different bones for the motion, starting from the root. As the skeletal mesh components, it's got it's associated to an animation here. This is just one animation of it, the falling after the jump, or even falling off a ledge. It, has, it runs this animation, and this is the, the full animation blueprint for connecting all the different types of animations through all the different inputs. So this is something that's more advanced, and I'll go over this in a future course. Now let's talk a little bit about widget blueprints. That's the, the HUD or the UI that you might see in a game. Part five, widget blueprint, Unreal Motion Graphics. In this section, we will go over the widgets menu bar, toolbar, editor mode, palette, the hierarchy, the visual designer, details panel, and widget animations. Widget blueprints allow you to create what's known as the Unreal Motion Graphics type of blueprint. It's anything that will have a graphic on your screen. So it could be like the UI HUD, like if you want to see like a mini map or like whatever hit points you have, or if you just simply have a menu that you want to have like selecting for game settings or just information like tutorial information just anything with words on it let's see a picture's worth a thousand words so let me show you i have this widget text come in there and then i spin up a unreal engine logo with some fancy animations now how i did that i'll hit escape here is in my third person character I added a widget this is a widget I created called UMG widget sample I added it to my viewport so it can be seen by the character and thus the player and then I took an animation that was in the blueprint and I played the animation using this node off of the widget but how did I do this? I created some widgets in this widgets folder. Go to user interface, widget blueprint. You can create one. I created two here. The first one I created was this UMG widget image. You can see that here. I simply added an image of the Unreal 5 logo. And then what I did is I added that widget, widget image, UMG widget image, it's the same name, UMG widget image. If I type in here, UMG widget image, that's one I created. 
up here in the palette, you'll see there's all types of pre-made widgets that are in Unreal Engine. However, as I just showed you, you can create your own. And they will appear here in the palette. There's also toolbar, just like there is with other blueprints. It's very similar. You can compile, save, debug. There's this unique thing called a widget reflector. This helps you diagnose problems with live widgets. Palette and the library of different widgets that you can use. You can see things that you might see on like a menu or some sort of other interface like a checkbox or a button, a progress bar could be like either for health to track how much, you know, damage you can do or how, how much life you have or like it's countdown timer, it can be tracking down. An image, I put an image in here, you can see the image is invisible right now and the reason it's invisible is because I have this animation down here. So if I play the animation, you'll see what happens. This text pans in, and this image fades in, and then spins. You can see I did that by creating an animation here. First I clicked this, then I added this animation, sample animation. You can see I can create another one. This one's empty. And then I track certain objects. So if I wanted to add this, I would say track, track size box. Now this text is in the hierarchy over here. Let me minimize my animations. So this is the hierarchy. It starts with your root here, which is the title sample widget, UMG sample widget. I added this canvas panel. In Unreal Engine 4, canvas panel was automatically added, but canvas panel is now just another widget you can add here. So the usefulness of a canvas panel I would always use a canvas panel when you are using your top level widget. If you notice, I didn't put a canvas panel in here because all this widget is is supposed to be attached to another widget. The canvas panel represents the actual screen edge, for example. And that's a good rule of thumb to try to gain and understand where the edge is. You can see here if I click on one of the widgets inside. Or any of the any of the widgets. Actually, no, I take that back. Not any of the widgets. Any of the ones that are in the hierarchy rooted to another one, you won't see this. But you see there's this little flower looking thing? This is the anchor. You can see up here on the details there's anchors. This is what you are showing it relative to because you're placing it somewhere on the canvas panel, or in the widget itself rather. Canvas panel, again, is the the basis for like what a screen size is, and the screen size can change. You can measure this against all kinds of screen sizes. If you notice up here, top level screen size for phones, for tablets, for laptops, if I wanted like, what are we on right now? We are, so let's say I wanted a MacBook, an iPhone. So this would be off the screen in an iPhone. So if you're testing this and you and you want to make sure that it's working with an iPhone, you're going to have to change where the anchor is, where the distance is, because otherwise this is going to spin up on and it's going to be off the screen, for example. And this is great for testing with various types of screens, televisions, nice big television. Let's do a 22 inch monitor. 27 inch monitor. See, everything changes just a little bit. This area is known as the visual designer. The visual designer is where you'll see the actual visual representation of the UI layout. There is also this section way up here in the right hand corner called graph. 
You might recognize this from other blueprints as like an event graph and variables, macros, functions, and functions quite similarly to other blueprints. Now we will go over a new type of blueprint that has construction script functionality so you can actually see it implemented in an editor. Part 6, Blueprint Prefabs with Construction Scripts. I'll now demonstrate the power of the construction script. I will show you a blueprint that creates a building that can expand based on needs. Other uses of Blueprint Prefabs with construction scripts include props for environments, automatic update for lights, scattering foliage, adjustable buildings in greater extent than I'm going to show you today, weather effects, and other advanced reasons. The construction script is a type of graph within Blueprint classes that executes when the actor is placed or updated in the editor, but not during gameplay. It is useful for creating easily customizable props that allow environment artists to work faster. An example of this is the Blueprint demo room within the Samples Content project. What is the demo room? Well, it's the room pretty much every demo's in. You click the wall here, you can see that it's Blueprint Demo Room. If I edit the blueprint, you'll see this wonderfully complex set of functions and blueprints. You know, in the viewport, it shows you the actual room. Notice there's only one chamber in the initial one. However, in the construction script, it says to flush persistent debug lines. That's a debug development only thing. But then it redraws. What does redraw do? If you double click on that node, it pulls up that function. Redraw is to create an instance and start creating walls for each room create end wall, and all these other functions. So it basically is a little bit of code that tells it to build the room. But why do we do this? Why did the creator of this room design it this way? Why is it so complex when you could have just placed these assets into the viewport? Well, now that I have an instance of this room, you can see here in its details, these different variables. An example is draw end wall. It's checked. Draw start wall. It's checked. So they're both there. An end and a start wall. What happens if I uncheck it? Did you see that? The end wall's disappeared. It no longer is drawn. But I'm not in play mode. It's not an effect in game. It's an effect in the editor. So it creates it based on whether or not that's checked. So if I did play with this not in there, it would have never drawn it in the first place, and thus it has a building without a wall. It can take away the start wall, can add them both back. Right now it only has one room. The way that it was programmed in here, we won't get into specifics, but just to see how powerful this tool is, you can just start adding rooms. Look at this hallway, I can keep on clicking, and I could get hundreds of rooms. Some of the sample projects have many rooms. This particular one only had one. Now it has many. With a project such as this, you, and this type of blueprint, you can create all kinds of things that you can put in your level, and they'll be adjustable. For instance, different buildings for a city. You can adjust each one, number of floors, how wide it is, what type of rooftop it has what it's made out of. You can do weather effects, you can do all kinds of things. They'll let your imagine run wild. But this is a powerful tool which is difficult to create, but once it's made, it makes the whole process much faster. We only went over a few of the different types of blueprints there are out there. For further examples and resources, please see the Unreal Engine official documentation, the Unreal Engine samples you can find in the launcher. The Unreal Engine Marketplace free assets, including the limited time free assets every month 
that starts on the Tuesday of every month. Check out the Epic Dev community for communication about this sort of thing. There's also some great YouTube channels. Matthew Wadstein's got a great one. There's some various other creators I'll include in the description. And of course, there are many other courses online and at learning institutions. Hopefully you learned enough about blueprints from this tutorial that you know where you need to look next and where you need to grow in learning about blueprints. We went over the basics about what a blueprint is and how it works, common blueprint classes and their purpose, the anatomy of a blueprint, playable character blueprints, a widget blueprint, blueprint prefabs with construction scripts, and where you can learn more. Thank you for taking this course and happy learning.